I'm very honored to open this session. And I'd like to invite uh, Professor Deshalit, Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences at Hebrew University, to give his greeting words. Mr. President, dear visitors, everybody, welcome. Um, not very often do we host a uh, president here. And not very often do we host uh, people who received uh, Nobel Prizes. But I find it very difficult to remember, apart from one time, which is our president, Mr. Perez, that we hosted somebody who both is the president of a state and somebody who received the Nobel Prize. And we are flattered and honored uh, that you are here in Jerusalem and at the Hebrew University. Um, I think that if one looks at um, your career, if I may say there are three concepts that immediately arise, reconciliation, liberty, and human rights. And we know that you have led um, a campaign for liberty and independence. And we are in the middle of looking, um, watching, and maybe even being inspired by some of our neighbors who are now in the middle of um, trying to achieve more liberty and more independence. It seems to me that everybody should um, be inspired by the way you led this campaign. It seems to me that reconciliation, liberty, and human rights are the three concepts which together characterize this campaign as <sighs> characterize this uh, campaign as the most noble it could be. So uh, this is another reason why we are so flattered and honored that you're here. I hope you will enjoy your visit. I hope you have some time to explore the beauty of this city. We even arranged some beautiful weather for you. And I'm looking forward to listening to your talk. Thank you. My name is uh, Avraham Sela, and I'm the director of the Davis Institute for International Relations. We uh, are lucky and, and very pleased to uh, take responsibility for this, uh, for this event. So any uh, failure or uh, good things that you would have about uh, the arrangements uh, should be directed to me. Uh, His Excellency, Dr. Ramos, Dr. Jose Ramos Holta, President of the Democratic Republic of East Timor, Professor Avner de Shalit, Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences, Mr. Chaim Hoshen, Head of the Asia and East Asia Department at the Israeli uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, colleagues, students, distinguished guests. I will not repeat the political biography of President Ramos Horta, which appears on the posters we published towards this event. What I will do is to introduce you to some additional important aspects of his personal history for which he deserves our admiration and, intention, and attention. President Jose Ramos Horta is a historical leader who from 1975 fought for his country's independence from Indonesian military occupation until 1999 when East Timor began its transition to independence under international supervision and support. Dr. Ramos Horta studied public international law, human rights law, and American foreign policy, and is a senior associate member of the University of Oxford, St. Anthony's College, where I had the pleasure of spending a sabbatical in the year 2000-2001. Indeed, in his political activity, President Ramos Horta demonstrated an outstanding combination of theory and practice which ended in exemplary moral success despite decades of harsh experience of persecution and exile, which stretched acro across continents and oceans from Australia to Western Europe and the United States. Moreover, along his political career, President Ramos Horta 
has provided a model of international leadership in a number of ways. First, despite his continued human rights, despite continued human rights violations by the occupying Indonesian military forces, he adhered to a peaceful solution of the conflict over East Timor's quest for independence. In, in this context, he promoted a peace plan to end the violence in his country, for which he won, along with Bishop Carlos Bello, the 1996 Nobel Prize for Peace. After receiving a Nobel Prize for Peace in 1996, he gave the award and prize money to a program called Microcredit for the Poor. Second, Dr. Ramos Horta continued to urge forgiveness and reconciliation all along the transition of East Timor to independence, and I believe ever since that year too. Third, demonstrating his personal and East Timorese humanitarian approach and long tradition of hospitality, President Ramos Horta has recently welcomed refugees if they are sent to his country as part of, an Aust of, of Australia's new plan for handling asylum seekers from conflict-stricken areas. Mr. President, I wish to express my highest esteem to your achievements for independence and peace to your country and the world and for the lessons we can all learn from your experience. President Ramos Horta will give us a talk on Timor-Leste, which is East Timor in Spanish, peace building, state building, and reconciliation experience and perspective. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming President Jose Ramos Horta. Uh, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm here with uh, our foreign minister, Dr. Zacharias Costa, who is here, uh, the head of our uh, Navy unit, uh, Commander Donaciano Gomez, uh, the head of our uh, information uh, uh, services, uh, former, uh, former judge, uh, former member of our National Reconciliation uh, Commission, uh, <laughs> Alcino Baris, uh, former Minister of Interior and a member now of the Supreme Council of Defense Security, <laughs> my uh, Deputy Chief of Staff, uh, uh, my Head of uh, Civilian uh, Security, uh, and my aide-de-camp, and the personal assistant to the, the foreign minister, and the ambassador of Israel to Singapore and uh, Timor-Leste. <laughs> well, I do not have a, any formal notes. Uh, I gave, uh, propose a title. Uh, I will elaborate uh, on that without uh, making any formal uh, uh, speech. So uh, forgive me if uh, it does not sound terribly uh, coherent if it's uh, rumbling um, uh, uh, <coughs> speech. First, maybe for uh, those of you who might not be familiar, uh, a uh, quick uh, background to the problem of uh, Timor-Leste. In 1975, uh, those of you who are familiar with the history of the world, particularly in Southeast Asia, you might uh, recall that was uh, one of uh, the most, and is still today, I believe, uh, the most uh, tragic and uh, humiliating uh, U.S. experiment in intervening in a third world conflict, in particular in trying to prevent the advance of uh, social revolutionary movements, the case of uh, Vietnam. U.S. went in there, uh, first under John Kennedy in the 60s, then escalated under Lyndon Johnson in the context uh, justified by his so-called domino theory. 
in that if you don't stop uh, a domino from falling, many others would follow. So the uh, U.S. went in there to prevent uh, uh, the expansion of uh, the so-called uh, North Vietnam communist uh, advances. It failed by 1975. You recall that humiliating the picture of a U.S. helicopter landing on the rooftop of the U.S. Embassy in Saigon, rescuing uh, U.S. officials, uh, CIA operatives, and a kick in, in the face, on the nose, any non-American who try also to get into the helicopter. Uh, and I'm not saying it in a literary fashion. You know, some people were actually punched on the nose for, because they were not supposed to be entitled to get into the helicopters to leave Vietnam. Well, it was in this context uh, that uh, the Portuguese Carnation Revolution took place, April 25, 74, uh, uh, discarding the 50-year-old dictatorship in Portugal, paving the way for uh, uh, the independence of Angola. And I mention Angola in particular because it was of enormous strategic importance or interest to the then Soviet Union and to the United States. And the uh, U.S. saw the loss of Angola, loss again, you know, in quotes, uh, because you can say lost to whom, you know, uh, for the U.S. it was lost again to the Soviet influence uh, with a, a massive uh, Cuban intervention, even though at the time uh, the Soviet Union did not endorse Cuban intervention in uh, Angola. Cubans went into Angola in their own evolution, their own decision in solidarity with the Angolans. The Soviets, as always, back then, uh, pragmatic, prudent. They wouldn't go too far in uh, challenging uh, the U.S. in areas of uh, well-defined U.S. interests. So uh, it was the Cubans who dragged the uh, Soviet Union into Angola, not the other way around, but for them. Uh, Cuba was always a proxy of the Soviet Union. And uh, so it was in this context that the U.S. was not looking at favorably uh, uh, an independent uh, East Timor. Secretary of State Kissinger uh, was in Jakarta on December 6, 1975, 12 hours after his departure, Indonesian troops invaded East Timor. Would, uh, in retrospect, we blame uh, anyone? Uh, of course, we blame those who invade us. But uh, East Timor ended up like millions of people around the world, you know, casualties of the Cold War, casualties of uh, the rivalry between the superpowers, rivalries between uh, uh, regional uh, minor powers. The the conflicts that existed then drag it into till today. Not necessarily always all of the making of the superpowers. And uh, sometimes superpowers intervene, exacerbate them, but uh, many of the conflicts had nothing to do with the superpowers. In the case of uh, Timor-Leste, well, uh, the Portuguese decided to have the revolution in 74. Uh, the revolution in Portugal radicalized with the Communist Party almost taken over in Portugal. It was stopped in November 75 by the then General Ramalho Yanis, leading uh, a counter coup against uh, left-wing officers and the Portuguese Communist Party. <coughs> but uh, uh, they were afraid that uh, an independent steamer could become yet another loss to uh, the U.S. interests in the region. So Indonesia went in uh, with 90% uh, of the weapons used there uh, supplied by the U.S. And in the following years, uh, the war would not have been able to be prosecuted by Indonesia without U.S. Uh, support. Well, if the Indonesian military had uh, checked with the Japanese uh, whether they should invade East Timor, 
the Japanese probably would have advised them not, because the East Timorese are stubborn guerrilla fighters, because we were invaded by Japan during World War II, and uh, Japan tried to use East Timor at the time as a stepping stone for their invasion of Australia. Well, they were bogged down there for several years, fighting a very small band of Australian commanders who were supported by the East Timorese. The conflict went on for the following 24 years, and uh, we saw, th in the meantime, the end of the Cold War, the crumbling of the Soviet Empire, the liberation of South Africa, independence, liberation of the Baltic states, etc., etc. You know all that is history. Finally, by 97, financial economic crisis in uh, Southeast Asia, starting first with Thailand, then uh, very quickly spread to Indonesia, more vulnerable, Hundreds of thousands of students, uh, people, peasants went to the streets in Jakarta and the regime capitulated and uh, a transition uh, administration came in led by a German educated uh, president, B.J. Habibi, and uh, who made a remark. I happened to be in Atlanta, uh, Georgia, visiting friends in the CNN. Uh, at the time, uh, when uh, B.J. Habibi, in his very uh, typical fashion, uh, he said, uh, talking to uh, Indonesian business people, East Timor is only is uh, not worth much, full of rocks, uh, nothing else. We shouldn't be wasting our time there. So by the end of this year, I want the problem of Timor resolved. That's how we announced a decision on it. East Timor. Actually, today, when sometimes I travel around the country, I remember what B.J. Habibi said. I said, yeah, he's actually right. We have so much rocks, rocks everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was, the few things he overlooked was that we also have lots of oil and gas, which today is fueling uh, our uh, economy. But by 99, the referendum was held. The vast majority of the people vote for independence. But tragically, the losers did not have a sense of uh, honor and dignity uh, and they set to destroy most of the country. I do not recall having been to uh, many, many conflict areas in the world, uh, such uh, a total devastation. Uh, Delhi, the capital, was destroyed at about to 80 to 90 percent. Some other towns, 100 percent. Only one or two towns escape with 20-30% uh, destruction. Not to mention the hundreds of thousands of people uprooted. Not to mention the years before where uh, 100,000, 200,000 people lost their lives out of a population of 700,000. So uh, we began independence after two years of the United Nations transition. The Security Council uh, believed that uh, a two-year transition is enough to have a, a modern state, nation-state build up from ashes of a conflict. I tried to argue with the, the then uh, Secretary General, but in particular with the head of the Department of Peacekeeping Operations, that a five-year transition would be minimum necessary to prepare the country thoroughly, uh, reasonably for independence. But Back then, there were two issues that uh, we faced. One, most of my own uh, colleagues in the leadership uh, were in a hurry uh, to uh, govern ourselves. Even two years old was already a bit too long, for some. I recall their words in meeting. I was a lonely voice uh, arguing for an extended period of transition. But the Security Council itself was very happy to have a, the shortest possible uh, transition. The then head of DPKO uh, from France, uh, Monsieur Bernard Mier, he said, if you pr manage to persuade the Security Council to have a two-year transition, you'll be lucky. So we had a two-year transition. By May 20, to, uh, 2002, uh, 
the flag of Timor-Leste went up, the flag of the United Nations went down, and we were handed over a country still thoroughly destroyed. During the two-year UN administration there, they put up a pretense of a court, a pretense of a public administration. Not a single infrastructure was built up. The UN for two years spent millions of dollars uh, leasing a boat where the UN officials uh, lived uh, for two years, etc., etc. So, uh, well, uh, uh, I once asked members of the UN Security Council uh, whether I made up a, I made up a, a, a story whether any of them uh, know how much, how long does it take to have a, a Manhattan, a New York uh, Chinese takeaway business uh, uh, up and running. Of course, none of them ever ran a takeaway uh, business in New York, neither was I. I lived 15 years in New York, but never. I used the takeaway many times, but uh, never ran one. <laughs> And uh, I simply made up a figure, said, so, well, I'm telling you, it takes about two to three years. Actually, a friend of mine, a New Yorker, said, no, Jose, it takes much longer than that, five to seven years before you pay off the bank uh, lo loan and uh, train the people and uh, start turning profit. <laughs> but uh, the Security Council members, uh, so I, thought, I, th I asked them, and do you really think you can have a a modern functioning democratic state in two years. If a Chinese take away business, you cannot do it in two, three years. Well, following that particular remarks in a lunch, informal lunch, but with all of them, the ambassador of Ghana uh, said, well, when I walk into the meeting and uh, I was with a mind that uh, the UN should not have a, any extended uh, time in Timor-Leste, but when I heard your comments referring to a takeaway, I uh, changed my mind and I will support extension of the UN mission there. That was a few years after 2002. Well, we have uh, we received a country in 2002, barely functioning, uh, without any infrastructure, electricity. We had, uh, we put out a tender for uh, telecommunications. Two companies came in one was a Sydney-based uh, local company, never no one ever heard of, and uh, the Portuguese Telecom. The Portuguese Telecom came because the Portuguese government, always generous towards us, with incredible generosity, pushed them to go to Timor-Leste to help, and they won the bid. Uh, and. Uh, no one, neither, none of the major donors, whether United States, Australia, Japan, uh, the European Union, ever thought of uh, doing proper um, planning and assignment, uh, task assignment to each of them. Like, for instance, someone would say, okay, you know, Japan, uh, we would uh, build up uh, an entire modern uh, road system for Timor-Leste. Australia could have said, we, for the next five years, we are going to put, uh, modernize your electricity. And one could say, we are going to revamp and modernize your health system. No, there was no such plan. And yet, a few years later, we were told that billions of dollars were spent in East Timor. Well, I coined a phrase. I said, well, they might have spent billions of dollars, on East Timor, but not in East Timor. <laughs> on East Timor mean on the hundreds of consultants, report after report, including reports that uh, you know I found out a uh, few years later. My own niece, I have a seven-year-old at the time. She was seven years old, six years old, eight. Very, very smart. Now she's a teenager. Uh, and uh, I would ask her to download some complex information for me. And uh, she would find that uh, those information faster than I did. And what would I pay her? I would only pay her like two scoop ice cream, chocolate ice cream. <laughs> but when she overheard that for the same work, you know, the UN, the Timorese government would pay tens of thousands of dollars, uh, she said, uncle, 
uh, don't you think you should buy me a laptop? <laughs> <laughs> I did mention that story in a speech at the United Nations, and I told her, Sarah, do you know you are now famous? I mentioned your name in the Evan General Assembly. <laughs> well, I'm obviously exaggerating a bit about uh, the failure of the international donor community, but I say so without animosity. Uh, only that uh, they should have learned, they should learn in dealing with other post-conflict uh, countries. Because after all, the money that is allocated to us and to any other developing country comes out of the generosity of the taxpayers in the rich countries. And the taxpayers want to see the lives of people really change in poorer countries. Uh, people to have uh, better access to schools, to health, to clean water, to a roof, to better roads, uh, etc., etc. But uh, for the last 50 years of the history of the foreign aid, well, not much has changed. Poverty has not decreased much. Uh, and where it decreased, like in the case of China, it is not thanks to foreign aid, as you probably uh, uh, know. So uh, in the case of Timor-Leste, we had this experience. Ten years later, uh, of course, countries like United States, Australia in particular, very sensitive, they begin to target more, making more a priority uh, some critical areas, particularly rural development, uh, food security, uh, uh, agricultural productivity, uh, capacity building, but in areas that are practical for, for the country. As we uh, received the country in 2002, in the conditions I uh, quickly described, we also had to heal the wounds of the society. We were a country of 700,000 in 75. Tens of two, uh, up to 200,000 people lost their lives in that period of time. Hardly any family in Timor-Leste was not affected. Till today, most uh, of the families have not uh, uncover uh, the disappearances, uh, the corpses, the bodies of those who died. And, uh, and it, but it was not only Indonesian side that inflicted uh, the, the, the killing. There was also infighting among East Timorese. So we had to reconcile with Indonesia. We had to heal the wounds internally among East Timorese, the same time as building the institutions uh, of a functioning democratic uh, country. We reconciled with all our neighbors, uh, developed relations with the region, with the world. And all of this we have tried to do in the past eight years since independence. God has been on our side because on day one of independence, we signed an agreement with Australia. Australia always obviously wanted all the oil going to Australia. Totally, <laughs> totally understandable, those sentiments. Um, even though, you know, Australia had its own curious definition of what, where uh, its maritime boundary should be. Anyone with uh, basic uh, common sense we have the law of the sea, establishing EEZs for coastal countries, where it overlaps, 200, 200, economic, uh, 200 miles, where it overlaps, you lay down the uh, median line. But Australia came up with a legal concoction, and that is our ge geological concoction, that, that uh, the the maritime boundary, the boundary should follow its continental shelf. Well, the continental shelf, which almost climbed up into our own streets, so, but and conveniently covering almost the entire area that has oil and gas. And, uh, but so we decided in a pragmatic fashion to put aside discussion on a maritime boundary and go for uh, resource sharing. So in the first instance, in 2002, we agree in a revenue sharing on Bayundan, a big, a modest gas, oil and gas field. We get 90% of, of uh, upstream revenues. Australia get 10%, but they get more benefits because the pipeline 
goes to uh, Australia. Within the next uh, two years after independence, we work on a petroleum law, establish a petroleum fund. Today, uh, view as the best in Asia, the third best in the world by Transparency International, by uh, Extractive Industries uh, Initiative based in London. Uh, the way we manage the petroleum resources with transparency, with integrity. We have accumulated uh, billions of dollars in only a few years thanks to oil prices skyrocketing. It is this that has enabled us to finance our budget. We are 100% self-sufficient. We don't need foreign aid to finance the budget. I, before I left, uh, I promulgated the 2011 uh, budget, which is $1.3 billion, entirely financed by our petroleum fund and other domestic revenues. But I cite this figure only for you to, uh, to, to, re re uh, to tell you what was the figure, our budget in 2002, when I was foreign minister. It was $68 million. In 2002, Within days of our independence, the budget that was approved by July 2002 was $68 million. And uh, where were all the rich countries that later talk about billions of dollars? Well, we managed our budget, which was $68 million. They managed the hundreds of millions of dollars of foreign aid. Where did they put it? As the French would say, "Ocunide." Uh, and, uh, of course, understandably, within uh, uh, the following years, we had social, economic, political problems that led to the first major convulsion in our country in 2006. Well, today the country is at peace as never before. We have uh, survived uh, many, many challenges. We have an active parliament with nine political parties. 30% of parliamentarians are women. Uh, uh, some of the senior cabinet uh, ministers are women, like the Minister of Finance, Minister of Justice, Prosecutor General, Minister of Social Solidarity, that manage one of the largest budgets in the country, Vice Minister of Health. We have a very dynamic uh, media an independent court system, and our economic growth has been double-digit in the last three years. If you look at the Economist yearbook, the pocket uh, uh, edition of 2010, you would see a surprising figure. We have the highest surplus in the world, almost 290% as percentage of GDP. Uh, the U.S. has... Uh, the, the biggest uh, deficit, uh, as you know, Japan and so on. We don't have a single dollar in, uh, in uh, debt, no national or private uh, sector uh, debt. Uh, but does it mean the situation is rosy? No. Peace is still fragile. Peace is always uh, a long, tortuous road. Only those who are, have a belief, have beliefs, convictions, patience, uh, architects of peace. You have to build peace block by block with individuals, with communities, and then in the end with the nation, with the region. We opted for reconciliation. Not one single person in our country who work with the other side, with Indonesia, uh, was uh, put in prison or murder in revenge. In the 24 years of our struggle, we are always guided by no violence against civilians. Not a single Indonesian civilian was murdered, kidnapped by the resistance fighters. There were killings among East Timorese, sometimes there were faction fighting, but uh, no one went out looking for Indonesian transmigrants, school teachers, wives, children of the transmigrants. Not a single case. And since independence, the last eight years, since 99, 10 years, not a single Indonesian living in our country has been uh, abused. 
we we have uh, probably the largest number of illegal migrants in our country from Indonesia. Some had been there before 99s, left, came back. Some uh, recent uh, illegal migrants. And we have been criticized for, uh, and me particularly, for being too benevolent in a pardon of left and right, uh, for refusing to uh, push for an international tribunal. Well, uh, on independence in 99, after Indonesia having packed and left, our philosophy is the greatest act of justice done to us is today we are free. We are free because Indonesia freed itself from the dictatorship. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of Indonesians also lost their lives to the military. And the new regime in Indonesia that began in 99, 2000, needed time, needed space to heal the Indonesian society itself and to build a new society, democratic process and institutions. And they have come a long way. And gradually the military losing privileges and power in Indonesia. And contrary to the fears of many, Indonesia uh, consolidating democracy and uh, rule of law. Still a long way to go, but the transformation in Indonesia has been remarkable. And we uh, could say we contributed a bit to it by not pushing for international tribunal, revenge. That would have caused a backlash against us. That would help to destabilize the incipient democracy in Indonesia because the many forces at play in Indonesia, not only Islamists, the secular nationalists, scholars, they all would demand from the president of Indonesia to take action against the East Timorese for pushing for international tribunal. So it would weaken the president. And we have, so in the last 10 years, developed excellent exemplary relationship with Indonesia at leadership level, people to people level. Current president of Indonesia, Sosili Bombang Widiono, on his very first foreign trip after he was first elected was to East Timor. I was then foreign minister and I volunteered to be his minister in attendance. And uh, circling the city with him, going to our cemetery, when we went to the uh, cemetery, the infamous, tragically famous cemetery, Santa Cruz, where took place an infamous massacre. And uh, there were people started gathering as we left the cemetery. I told the president, Mr. President, let's not get back into the car. If you don't mind, could you please greet the people? And he greeted the people. And what happened was actually a commotion. Everybody wanted to shake his hand. An older man cried. And then we went to the Indonesian military cemetery. And then we went to the, uh, the parliament and I told him, Mr. President, in the car, you know, we have uh, this unfortunate uh, situation where the university is across the street from the parliament. Whenever students wish to do a demonstration, they don't have to bother uh, paying for taxis or minibuses. They just uh, stand right there. So, and I'm sure they will be there. So if you don't mind when we get off the car, you turn around to them and greet them. And he did. Tremendous applause from the students. Not one single act of hostility. I texted the special president of the Secretary General, Mr. Sukehiro Hasegawa from Japan, because the UN, having left Timor in 2002, never pushing for an international tribunal while they were there, with full executive, legislative executive authority, suddenly became very heroic, talking about justice. So I uh, texted him by saying, Suki, if you wanted a referendum on our policies, you had it in the streets of Dili, how people reacted to the president of Indonesia. So that's where we are today. Indonesia has been the strongest advocate of our membership in ASEAN. God willing, this year or next year, which should become the 11th member of ASEAN.
and affected Indonesia. Having left Timor-Leste in 2002, particularly in 1999, we have to say, in humiliation, you know, we, in our public discourse, we never once used the word, we defeated them. If anything, we say we won. And the we mean Indonesia and us. Indonesia won democracy, won their freedom, we won our independence. And, uh, and the Indonesians appreciated that. We never rub the wounds of those who think they might have lost. And we always try to tell them, you lost nothing. You won your democracy, your own freedom. You got rid of a problem. And uh, what was remarkable is how they turn around, walk halfway, and embrace East Timor. They could have uh, cynically said, you want their independence, now good luck. Turn their back on us, ignore us, indifferent. No, they have been very proactive in trying to assist us in many ways. We, Timorese no longer need visa to go to Indonesia, for instance. The thousands of Timorese students in Indonesia do not pay foreign fee. They pay local national fee as an Indonesian student. It would have been an impossible burden for us if East Timorese students had to pay uh, foreign uh, fees. And that is remarkable. And the uh, success of our uh, decision to let the past belong to the past, we honor our dead, our victims, as we can, and we have done so, but we are not demanding others. Even in relation to United States, Australia, Japan, those who supported Indonesia, we say, well, in 99, the then President of the United States, Bill Clinton, played a critical role in having Indonesia accepting a referendum and leave in Timor-Leste. The United States also changed. If anything, if we look back at uh, the Cold War, well, everybody was a victim. Maybe those who concocted the Bolshevik Revolution might be the only ones who uh, caused these uh, uh, the, the following decades of uh, of ideological conflict that brought in the <clears throat> so much damage, maybe. But uh, my point is only to say not to blame anyone. Our responsibility is to those who are alive, those who are victims psychologically, emotionally of the violence of the past. So that's where we are today. Our country, Timor-Leste, is free vibrant democracy, uh, a lot of uh, political activism. I don't know whether I'll, with so much going on around the world, uh, I, I don't uh, have Facebook, I don't tweet, and, uh, but Facebook is very uh, uh, popular also in uh, East Timor, I, I'm told. Uh, who knows by the time before I leave here, you will see in the news, President Ramosort has been ousted by... <laughs> <laughs> I will go to Sharm el-Sheikh. <laughs> Not a bad place. And <laughs> in 2006, we had a big crisis in Timor-Leste. Even though the then Prime Minister resigned and I took over as transition Prime Minister, well, there was some... Uh, People, they were not satisfied. They would come to me and say, uh, there had to be early elections. I said, no, there will be no early elections with me. And uh, don't bother demonstrate. Don't worn out the sole of your shoes by jumping up and down. Do you want me to resign? I resign right away. But you take responsibility for what happened next. Well, they left and there were no demonstrations. We had elections in the following year as planned in our calendar under the Constitution. 
uh, we quickly got out of the crisis, resolved the issue of uh, the IDPs, no longer any refugee in the country. We are reforming the police, the army. In 2012, we have a new presidential elections, legislative elections. I hope we have less political parties. Uh, now we have nine political parties out of uh, one, uh, point, 1 1.1 million people, nine political parties. I once in Timor-Leste, in 2001, I hosted three different uh, debates. There were two political parties, almost with four, uh, two polit uh, four political parties, almost the same names. One is Social Democratic Party, the other one, Social Democratic Association. <laughs> one, Christian Democratic Union, the other one was Christian Democratic Party, whatever, I don't remember the name. I was the moderator. I asked the leader of the then Social Democratic Party uh, and the Social Association, can you please explain to me the ideological difference between the two? No difference. <laughs> and, the and I asked the two Christian Democratic parties, any theological difference between the two, the road to heaven, if, where there is any different uh, approaches? <laughs> no. Well, in this regard, I think we're a bit like Israelis. <laughs> we hear two Israelis have uh, three opinions. <laughs> well, I have to say, East, each East Timorese have two, three opinions. He changed, or he, I would say he, because the women are a bit more stable in my country than men. <laughs> <laughs> he changed his mind as he goes along. He can say one thing today, tomorrow he says something else. But as I don't look at the joke about the Israelis, two Israeli, three opinions, as negative, I say, well, maybe that's why they are so creative, they are so uh, dynamic, so smart. And uh, for us, yeah, that's democracy. In, uh, and we are doing very well. So that's where we are in a, a snapshot of uh, Timor-Leste today. I thank you. Mr. President, thank you so much for an amazing tale of uh, Timor, East Timor rise from occupation to independence and to democracy, and for your personal tale of uh, an amazing story of reconciliation and conflict resolution. I think I won't surprise you if I tell you that uh, the case of East Timor is being taught all over the world as a, as a case study uh, in, in conflict resolution but to hear it from you makes it even more uh, rich and, 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 and full, and I can appreciate it uh, much more uh, by listening to you and to all those small gestures that you uh, told us today. And thank you so much again for choosing the Hebrew University for your public talk during this official visit. Uh, we are all honored by uh, this choice, and we thank you uh, very much for uh, honoring us with your, your uh, presentation. And let me, for a uh, souvenir and a, a commemoration of this, uh, this event, uh, give you a very humble present. Thank you. This is, uh, I will disclose to you, uh, even though you will let her see it, uh, that this is a, a collection of uh, Albert Einstein's uh, personal papers, uh, all of which are held by the Hebrew University, who is also the possessor of the rights of using everything that has to do with uh, Professor Albert Einstein. Mm, so you. I hope that this will be a small step, your visit, this talk, to a long uh, friendly relations between Israel and East Timor, and even more so between the Hebrew University, and I hope one day with the University of Dili, which I understand is uh, being built and, and making extremely uh, uh, great progress. So with all this, once again, I would like to thank you again and wish you a great success in the peace building and state building of your country. Please be seated.
remain seated when uh, the president and his entourage are leaving the, the hall. Thank you. This is a, it's called Thais, it's handmade uh, by women uh, from Timur as a, as a dress for men, for women, but um, many people use it for decoration, but uh, also we uh, normally <laughs> yeah. as a, Thank you. Thank you so much. I uh, also would like to uh, share with you my most successful uh, literary, <laughs> <laughs> and is in Hebrew. Wow. Uh, uh, the first of a series of books, uh, uh, children's stories. I enjoy more writing these than uh, my uh, the uh, big political uh, presidential speeches. Uh, a special edition done uh, to bring to Israel in Hebrew, but also we have uh, in Arabic. And also uh, we have, uh, besides oil, oil and gas, and before oil and gas, the biggest uh, export we had was coffee organic Arabica coffee. In the 50s and 60s, the official coffee in the Buckingham Palace was a Timor coffee, Arabica, 100% or, or uh, uh, organic. And uh, <coughs> uh, the biggest uh, buyer is Starbucks. 40% of uh, our coffee is bought, is bought by Starbucks, followed by Germany, and then the rest, like Australia, Singapore, and uh, so on. Uh, it, uh, particularly uh, for, for the elderly, uh, and uh, a word of caution, uh, not for you, Professor, because you are not so elderly, <laughs> but uh, uh, it has been tested, it's been found to have strong uh, Viagra content. <laughs> so uh, don't... Uh, uh, Singap Singaporeans with the lowest birth rate in the world are buying a lot of this. Oh, sure, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the president uh, is uh, uh, kind enough to uh, receive a few uh, questions from the audience, so uh, we'll um, moderate it uh, from here. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Ronnie Adib. I just came from Timo yesterday. <laughs> I happen to be on the same flight with you. And uh, it's my pleasure and appreciation of, of seeing you. And, and how, you how did you end up in Timo? Uh, I was a team leader transport economist for the national road system in 2009. And uh, I was called by the World Bank uh, a month ago to come for implementation part of the program. So I'm, I'm perhaps one of the better consultants, hopefully. <laughs> uh, we are, uh, the World Bank is going to implement the, the, the section from uh, uh, Dili to Aniero. And uh, the uh, Japanese are going to, to build the section from uh, Dili to the border with Indonesia that you mentioned so much the importance of the relation, and I can be a witness to it. So uh, it's my pleasure, and uh, really it's a great grief for me to be twice in uh, Timor Leste, and coming to you, I found out on the same aeroplane. So Pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs> pleasure. When uh, a few years ago, uh, our uh, the then president, uh, Shanana Guzman, uh, had asked uh, Israel through the ambassador at the time, to send an economist to work with uh, our government. It was promised and never delivered. So, uh, Prime Minister Ariel Sharon in New York during a meeting hosted by the then President of the United States, he was sitting alone at a corner waiting for the meeting to start. It was a restricted meeting. 
to which I was invited. I introduced myself to him, and I immediately reminded him of the promise made to us. And he said at that time, well, I know someone who right now is unemployed and uh, knows a lot about finances. He was referring to Netanyahu. <laughs> who, uh, well, uh, destiny would have it that uh, Netanyahu would have been our uh, economic advisor in Timor-Leste. But uh, apparently uh, Netanyahu refused uh, Sharon's uh, uh, suggestion. So now we have you. So uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yes, uh, I want to thank you for a very informative and also very entertaining lecture. Uh, I have three little questions to ask you. The first one is, did you give your niece the laptop? <laughs> the second question is, uh, you, you won the Nobel Peace Prize. Your predecessor, Shanana Guzmao, I think, if I'm pronouncing the name correctly, he was more of a fighter than a man of peace. What is his standing today in the East Timorese public opinion? Or how is he looked upon? And the third question is, what is the role of Portugal in East Timor today? Well, uh, the, fir the first uh, question, uh, yes, I gave her a laptop. <laughs> And, uh, but she was very suspicious of me every time I asked her to do something because she remembered you know, how we pay thousands of dollars to consultants and to her, I uh, just you know, have a, a, a nonsense conversation with her about uh, chocolates and uh, so she's no longer very uh, persuaded. Uh, even a laptop is no longer enough. Uh, second, uh, no, Shanane Guzman was and he is today uh, remain one of the most revered leaders of the country. It was uh, with his authority as a guerrilla fighter, prisoner, uh, who uh, was able to impress upon the whole country the road for uh, reconciliation and uh, domestically and with Indonesia. If it were not for that uh, strong authority he had, it would have been far more difficult than national conciliation, reconciliation with Indonesia. I can go only by opinion poll. In, uh, 19, in two years ago, there was a survey done by the International Republic Institute uh, uh, on approval rate of leaders or institutions in the country. Uh, Prime Minister Shanan Guzman, uh, he had an approval rate of something like, I think, 79%. The whole of the government had an approval rate of, uh, I think, 65 or 75%, I don't, I don't recall. While in 2006, in the midst of our uh, political crisis, the general opinion vis-a-vis uh, -vis the institution, the leadership must have been very low, uh, it uh, recovered. So he continued to command uh, enormous authority. When I addressed the Nobel ceremony in Oslo, I paid tribute to him and I said the person who should be here to receive the award was Shanana Guzman. And I did what uh, was never done in the 100 year history of the Nobel Peace Prize. I gave away the gold medal uh, to our resistance fighters in a public ceremony because consistent with what I said at, uh, in Oslo, the real heroes, you know, are those who are in the mountains uh, fighting for freedom. In a ceremony in August 2000, I hand over the gold medal uh, to them, which they cherish uh, uh, a lot. So, uh, <clears throat> and uh, I hand over to Shanana at the time still as the Command, uh, head of the, our uh, resistance forces, but uh, he also automatically hand over to the new uh, commander of the, our defense forces. Your third question, sorry. Portugal. Portugal remains one of our most loyal uh, friends way back during our struggle for independence till today. Uh, the amount, the proportion of uh, Portuguese assistance, you know, as you know, Portugal is not uh, very rich country, uh, but it has a very generous overseas development assistance to many countries. 
and Timor-Leste probably uh, get the greatest chunk of that uh, ODA. Uh, we still, till today, they support us providing uh, military training for our defense force, our Navy. Uh, we also have a lot of cooperation with Australia, New Zealand, United States. We have a police training with uh, Indonesia. Uh, we have uh, four Timorese uh, studying the Navy Academy in Japan. Uh, so we have a, a vast array of uh, relationship. And Portugal, no doubt, is one of our very best uh, friends. words about the organization to which I belong. Uh, as you know, we have a small conflict here too. Uh, we have uh, bereaved families, Israelis and Palestinians, have joined forces to work for reconciliation here. And we are struggling with the problem of where should the reconciliation process begin. We began even if there is no agreement. And there is an ongoing discussion. When should this process begin? We are firmly working in this direction. And we would very much wish to have leaders that are uh, inspired by the same spirit that you are. But uh, regretfully, it's not working that way. So I would like to, I would invite you to think with us uh, about this problem. You think that a reconciliation process can be installed, can be developed before uh, what is your experience on that? Before an agreement is reached? Or should the reconciliation process begin only after the formal, the formal agreement is signed? Well, uh, uh, I have to say, you know, uh, this is an area of the world that I read about for many, many years, decades maybe, and the, the first time I'm coming to Israel and maybe to Palestine. As you know, the Palestinian Authority resigned en masse. I seem to have uh, this uh, bad impact on people, you know. <laughs> I, 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 I tell you, in 2006, I was prime minister. I was in Rome meeting with Romano Prodi. In the afternoon, he resigned. <laughs> I was in Japan last year. Great meeting, two hours with uh, Hatoyama. And a uh, few days later, he resigned. <laughs> I go to Canberra. I go to Cam I go to Canberra last year. Can Big. <laughs> I I met with Kevin Rudd, great prime minister. Well, I met with him in the evening, had drinks in his house. The next day, he decided to resign. And uh, now I come here. I hear he resigned en masse. Well, some people are suggesting to me, why don't you go to North Korea? <laughs> 